Hello, and welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I'm Jess. And I'm Gary. And today we're going to review and discuss Screamers, which came out in 1995, based on the short story Second Variety by Philip K. Dick, with an original screenplay by Dan O'Bannon and Miguel Tiada Flores, and directed by Christian DeGay. Well, Gary, what were the general synopsis of this? Well, the story follows Commander Joseph Hendrickson, played by Peter Weller, in the year 2078 on a mining colony on planet Sirius 6b during a military conflict. Joseph travels across the devastated war zone to seek peace, but soon discovers that the claw robots built as weapons have gained sentience and have evolved. The silence of space is about to be shattered, and the last scream you hear will be your own. No! Don't do that. Scared you, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus! So, Dan O'Bannon had the idea of making this into a movie back in the early 80s. He wrote uh, a screenplay... Um, but uh, it just never it never materialized it never went forward so much so that you know uh, it would be you know it wouldn't be until the mid 90s uh, that you know a new screenwriter was was brought in to uh, change the script and even the director and star peter weller were making alterations to the script as they went into production and it was only when the film was actually finished that Dan, did dan o'bannon get a notification that uh, he was getting a writing credit in a script for a script that he wrote like 15 years ago well, yeah, it's a strange film, and I mean, it is honestly maybe those all those different people coming in to edit the script. It does feel what? weighed down with multiple plot threads. Strange, like we 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 talked just before this, trying to make sense of some of it, and there were some contradictions online about who does what, what's who. Is some of this fan fiction? Is some of this based on kind of the original screenplay where there was maybe a different interpretation of who the characters were going to be. I can imagine that the alterations would have arised from the original script being maybe more faithful to the book, whereas this revised script takes place now not on Earth and, and changes yeah. you know a lot of the things this, from, yeah. from the original this story. This is trying to be a multitude of things, and that's probably the sci-fi equivalent of like everything at once. You end up with... Without spoiling too much, we're looking at some mixture between Blade Runner, post apocalyptia Terminator, Alien. Yeah, uh, it, it's every kind of a, it's a war story, and then it isn't a war story. Um, well, the film starts off with the you know a great big wall of text, which really does really just does all the world building for you. It's a Star right Wars, off the get again, go. it's a Star Wars roll text moment. Well, it's also, you know, like like Blade Runner, like a lot of Philip K. Dick's stuff, it needs to get you up to speed on, the, you know, the, the world that the film is going to be taking place in. And the film, for me, has an incredibly strong opening sequence. Mm. It's probably my favourite sequence in the film, where you see this, this, this soldier making his way across what appears like a desert wasteland. And we also see some other soldiers in a bunker watching him. You know, they've got their guns trained on him. You know, they've identified him as an NEB, which is the enemy, uh, which stands for New Economic Block, whereas the, the team in the bunker are the Alliance. But they're like, he's on his own. What's he doing out there? And then we see shapes or things move in the sand. You know, straight away you're thinking tremors, like something yeah. is in the sand. Is it an indigenous species? Uh, but no, it turns out that these are the screamers and everybody knows about them. And so I'm kind of like, why is this NEB soldier? How has he managed to get here with these death bots lurking in, in, in the sand? He screams that he's holding a canister. He's got something. We find out that he's he's there with a peace offering, but the screamers make short, gory work of him. You know, they cut his arm off, they take his leg off, and he's, you find him crawling around in the sand before, well, we can imagine a screamer has gone for his face, because we see the reaction shots of the Alliance troopers, and even one of them starts getting teary-eyed and upset. You know, another one just, throws up. Another one throws up. It's just like, it, it makes you wonder how you know that this war has been going on they must be used to seeing it but we also soon find out that the enemy haven't seen each other in almost six months uh there seems to be kind of like a, a standoff uh uh you know a ceasefire it, it's very it's very odd the whole this is where this film immediately starts getting weird because there's loads of like oh, man i'm gonna have a hard time keeping up with all this there, there's there's questions that start cropping up and it 
you get more as you kind of go into the film of exactly what's going on on this planet. There's beautiful vistas, as you say. Um, makes you feel post-apocalyptic. There's been nukes drops and the planet's in some sort of nuclear winter. That's why I like the idea of it's almost desert-like with snow. Wherever they shot that, it was, a it was perf- all in Canada. Yeah, it was a perfect set. They must have done it in some sort of a old mining area. It was a there. quarry in one yeah. one location. Yeah, yeah it, it was perfect in the layout, and it just gave you that feel of this post-apocalyptic. Oh yeah, complete with fantastic map paintings, which just <sighs> finished. You know, the, the animated, final touches. Slightly animated some of them. Some of the, oh, I was just really. It was such the especially when you're traveling later in the movie, where you travel through the broader world. Some of the best bits of this are little snippets, um, like without going too much near the end. You get a more of it right near the end with that plaque as well, which is celebrating. So I, I, I won't go into. What, I think it's celebrating the discovery of this planet because this planet's got a special mineral that was maybe the energy solving problem to the galaxy, and that's the key reason the whole war was fought. And you get that set up straight off the rolling credits, which is part of the reason it ended up going wrong, though, and it irradiated the planet, and then the miners were like, "We that, that's what caused this split. So, going... And again, this is where we talk... This is where I talk about problems, because it's got this kind of deep-rooted, kind of philosophical argument, like, the miners didn't want to work in irradiated conditions, so why didn't they use robots? Because they're apparently can these deadly little buggers that swim into sand. Again, it just... You're like, okay, your technology's that good, but you just still insisted on sending people into the death mines. And our side's a good side, right? Tell me again, the line gets a little blurry. Oh. Wow. Welcome to the future. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> here, here, here's some radiation cigarettes. Smoke these so that because, you don't get poisoned. Yeah, it, it quickly turns out the Alliance, the people you are introduced to in this bunker, led by their commander, who is obviously uh, Peter Weller, their command from Earth gave them the designs to make these terrible burrowing death robots um <laughs> which basically just secure the perimeter and they all wear armbands which means that the screamers the claws won't attack them yeah it recognizes them as friendly and later on it's discussed that they're actually a facility somewhere they've never got they turned it on a ran and started running which was the pun um so there's a replication base somewhere on the planet that's making these um it's completely automated now yeah completely automated and why would you do that? I mean, it, it's a, you, you, your brain slightly melts because everything is slightly dumb at this point. And that's the biggest issue with this script, again, is it's got some beautiful sequences, some fairly cool ideas, but the chain of logic breaks down every couple of steps because you're not quite sure what's going on. There's so much duplicity as well, which we'll go into later, where you're like, we're not sure who the, who's manipulating who. But you get the inter- introduction to the commander and his number two in the base. Yeah. Um, and they've got a good chemistry with each other. You can feel the history. I do like seeing the rest of the military base. You can see it's very well populated. There's lots of soldiers and scientists. Yeah, yeah. It, um, it makes you feel mostly like this could be a planetary outpost. Which I'm yeah. going to keep saying. They don't show enough of a broad military. No. Um, because uh, it doesn't feel like that's a whole planet's well, it, it, army. We, we do soon find out that... Um, when a, when a shuttle crashes on Sirius B, almost right outside their outpost, after they've already had contact with a, a military advisor from Earth, saying that they're looking for a, uh, a ceasefire and, and actual peace talks. And ignore the message you just got from the enemy. Right. And, uh, and then when the shuttle crashes, there are no survivors, bar one... It's uh, Ace Jefferson, played by Andrew Lauer, who who explains to them that, no, the war is still very much on, and he was part of a military team amongst many, many others that were going to this other planet where the war is to continue. See, this is where I get confused. That ship had Cyrus 6B on the side of it. Meaning it was originating from that planet. No, it wasn't. That's the no. problem. It, it was masquerading as a civilian ship. Um, and uh, and that's why Joseph is just like, no, this is not a milit- this is not a civilian ship. There's something suspicious going on here. And it's when Ace tells him that you know that that message that you received, that that commander, he was- he, he was he was uh, arrested and executed like two years so, ago. So they're being tricked by their command, or should we say the other robotically minded individuals? We're not sure which. Beg your pardon, sir. I don't know what you saw or what was sent to you, but Secretary Green was arrested and eliminated by the Alliance Command. 
two years ago. We no, don't know it's who's not getting necessarily tricked. explained whether it was just a delayed message or, or, or what. No, 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 because it was responding directly to the question they'd asked. So it was either the duplicity of their high command going, oh no, don't worry, keep fighting the war, we're trying to bring peace, as we send soldiers to kill them all. Um, and as he said in the bar, because there's a bar sequence just before that shuttle crash, and there's a conversation just before the bar scene, which is like, sir, there's a, that's when the civilian transport conversation comes up. And it's just like, what's going on? Um, and, and the problem is, I think it's too all over the place from the start because i was later confused because i'm like okay so the message from the other team was that duplicitous who knows it's not even clear nobody knows who's being sneaky here maybe, yeah but i think that that, maybe they died that 10 builds minutes part of the mystery like you know <sighs> we are on the ground level with the grunts they don't know no, what's going on you, it's not you vital might reveal to the story some of it near the end just so we know how sneaky one side was being on the other side was being. If everyone was being ambiguously sneaky, your stakes start getting shaken to the point of, I don't know any information I'm told matters. And at that point, do I care if any information I'm told matters? And therefore I lose every emotional investment I get, except maybe in the main character, but we'll get into what happens to him later. And that's also a little bit confusing because character development arcs are really fast near the close of this film. Well, we get some good character development here with in Ace the bar, and the Joseph. Bars, yeah. and, uh, and, you know, and, and, and Joseph decides like he, you know, despite whatever is going on, he needs to find out whether he can broker a peace because he is war torn he is sick and, and tired of the conflict he's, pissed. he's been lied to by Ex Tyra. exactly so he's like screw it i'm going to take this peace message and i'm going to walk all the way over to the any any b base and find out what the hell is going on uh ace you're coming with me <laughs> yeah and they still they were still getting supply drops so i guess the head kai command knew they were there but here's the other thing and, and, and what and like that, that ship tries to uh, land there i mean hope nobody else tries to land there in the years to come um, <laughs> but anyway, the two of them are going to set out on their journey across the apocalyptic wonderland, uh, and it is beautiful. It is true. Oh, it really, really is. Like great location scouting, accompanied by fantastic map paintings, just really, really bring this. It's world done to within life. a good controlled budget. It, it yeah. really is some miniature work, a little bit, I think, but most of it is just paintings. Which is again why you might compare it to something like Blade Runner and go, oh, well, Blade Runner looks better, but that's. Fill a, fill a room with miniatures, guys, and take shots of it. And that's why Blade Runner looks, all these years later, is fantastic. Which, this film dates a tiny bit, um, but not that badly. I mean, I was surprised. Like, the in, first shot you get of the whole film, when we sort of jump back... Is a CGI it's, space it's, shot. Yeah, yeah but it's done and relatively okay. It's okay. It aged, but the way they come in from all outer space... Have a, have a meteorite explode in the upper atmosphere and then drift down to the planet. Yeah, it it, it stands a lot of te the test of time in the terms of having been a really cool sequence to introduce to opening of a film. Yeah, the, the broader point is that this film does really well. I mean, it, it is it is quite impressive. I remember watching this film. Oh, I don't know how old I would have been. Um, must have been fifth in my early teens, and I remember watching it and just being blown away. I just remember at the time really sticking with me, because it is it is a good little um, sci-fi romp, and it stood it stands up. I mean that's the interesting thing. Um, in purely its kind of graphics and stuff, uh, and prosthetics and gore, what yeah. you said with the execution they got at the beginning. Well, the abandoned city that they end up that you know great. making their way into at first, and it it seems war torn. You know, there's tops of buildings missing. It's just debris everywhere. It's very, the very streets terminated. are filled yeah, with, yeah. with with all of the fallout, and and that is when we get introduced to David. We hear this voice. Asking, can I come with you? And you're just like, what? There's a survivor in all of this wreckage? <laughs> and you're just like, okay. And you know, and, and, and Joseph's just like, you know what? You, you can't come with us. We know they're intrigued by him. They're like, how did you survive? How are you surviving against the screamers? How have the you radiation, survived the radiation? What is it you are actually been eating out here? Uh, but they're like, you know, you can't come with us. We're on a military mission. So you just stay here and we'll come back for you in a couple of days. And as they walk around the corner, you know, Ace is just like, no, man, we can't leave him behind. We've got to take him with us. He's just a child. And you hear it again. Can I come with you? And you're just like, it sounds human, but there's like it's a, too... it's just slightly, you know, alterated where you're just like, I 
Maybe. It's just already maybe. too weird. And that's the biggest issue, especially in mo- the scene before um, you have the commander give Ace one of the cig- cig- red cigarettes, red wrapped cigarettes, or anti-radiation cigarettes. It's an odd way to give people anti-radiation medicine, but we're not going to question it because this whole film's got weird choices. So they're smoking these red cigarettes to not die of radiation poisoning because nukes were dropped on the planet. The radiation mines were radiating radiation because, you know, radiation. Um, it's a radiation hellhole, apparently. I'm not sure if there was actually nukes used, but he does he explain... Did, no, the yeah. enemy used them. He makes okay. the comment when they find that one in the... Uh, yeah, the bunker the, they, they have not used them. We never used them, but the yeah. enemy did. Yes, That's yeah. when the civilians were getting nuked while they were trying to nuke them. The yeah. civilians then were evacuated back to Earth, apparently. So there are not meant to be any civilians on this planet. Just help sets up the NEBs as being the real bad guys of, of the story. Yes, because the, the, the Earth Alliance... Yeah. Um, are kind of the good guys, but then they're foreshadowed to not be the good guys because they're tricking the commander because they're like, we can't pull you guys back because you'll hurt them in the war effort we've now got going on. Right. The next one. That's his theory anyway, the commander. Yeah. Um, and you're not sure if he's right, and we're not sure if it's even the uh, Earth High Command talking to him. And and he, nobody's sure what's going on anymore because, again, as I said, it's, it's a bit confusing and kerfuffle. But you end up with this kid who's clearly suspicious as hell and shortly, and it's so quick they deal with it as well. Oh no, he was suspicious as hell. Well, they take they decide to take the, the you know the boy with them, and we get again one another one of my favorite sequences where we have a, a campfire setting. Um, Ace is watching holographic uh, nudes, <laughs> which which Joseph immediately gets angry with him and destroys them. He's like, "How are you supposed to be alert? You know, when we're in enemy territory, when you're when you're watching and listening to this stuff." Um, and there's also a cool scene with uh, where he picks up a rock. And it's not a rock; it's a bug. <laughs> it's like okay, yeah. it's, again, it's just a little bit more more world building. We're seeing some of the alien life from this planet, or we're seeing insects that have evolved from the radiation of the planet. Well, we see one m- mouse earlier, only a little bit earlier in that particular day, should we say? And that's destroyed by a screamer that's hunting down. Yeah, the yeah, it's just reminding you that the screamers are still there. Um, but uh, yeah, they end up continuing their journey towards the NEB base. The three of them are starting up to approach when we get introduced to two other soldiers. We get introduced to Becker, played by Roy Dupas, and we get introduced to Ross, played by Charles Edwin Powell. They've got their guns trained on the three approaching strangers, and he immediately pulls the trigger and blasts David. You know, and your first time watching this, you're going to be like, holy shit, like, they're the NEB, of course, they're the bad guys. They shot and killed the kid. And, you know, that is when Joseph makes the revelation, same as us as the audience, even though we might have had our suspicions, he was, for all intents and purposes, a Terminator. He's a robot, a disguised robot. And here's the fun thing, it is designed almost to be misdirection, which we'll later reveal. Um, And to that, in retrospect, I appreciate it, but also was... They're so, so casual about destroying them. And I'm just like, how expendable are they? I mean, not, well, later on, we know how expendable they are. But um, it is it is almost farcical. <laughs> well, it, it, it's the shock horror of killing the child. And then, the, you know, the added shock of realising that these screamers have evolved. That they have been able to take human form and be able to communicate. Um, and yeah. so that leads you to think, like, what else have these robots been up to? Well, yeah, it is immediately the uh, Blade Runner... Like a, they're trying to cover a lot of bases, and it, it is fine, but because you never go, I thought. I mean, honestly, I thought halfway through this, if I didn't know the ending, because again, as I watched this in my teens, um, I was like, oh, so they're going to get those nukes you were talking about, roll them in, and just like blow up the hive, as it were. No, no, that that would make sense. If I you... don't think they even know where the hive is, or even if it was where it was originally. Well, that's the thing. <laughs> the commander spoke about it as if he did, and so you're like, oh well, and then. Oh, he said he'd never been there. So yeah, he'd, he'd never, never been never there, but he it. might know where it is. Because again, <laughs> or was, uh, was. <laughs> yeah, they, they may have moved it, but even if they've moved it, it sounds like it's a pretty big operation. So I don't know. Anyway, but obviously we end up with them meeting up with now the three extra members of the cast. Yes, yeah. There we find out that the uh, the NEB team have been reduced down to just three personnel. Uh, the rest of the NEB uh, task force or military force have been absolutely annihilated. By screamers. Well, they don't know that for certain because you get the well, smuggler. She ex- she's a smuggler. Yeah. She's actually a black, a black market dealer, dealer, a trader. Yeah. Which is kind of weird because. But she just... explains that the the military on the NEB side went absolutely quiet, like 
many, many months ago. Yeah, and um, there's these two soldiers from the NEB who are both... Well, one's a, a one's nervous just wreck. A, yeah, absolutely. He's seen too much. And you've got the other one who's got the tear tattoos on his eyes. We know he's probably a cold-blooded murderer. He acts like a psychopath. He's there to antagonise every other character. He is, for all intents and purposes, this movie's douchebag. And he does it incredibly well. Yeah, he, he, <laughs> he definitely does fill a role. Of, up to a point. Afraid of the Dark Cross? Just get off my back. Uh, but obviously the commander's like, well, I've got to go in and find out what happened to them. Exactly. So he presses her for information and she kind of agrees to, to, to take, take them there. And I will say, I will bring up now, there, there's an uncomfortable moment in the film where, you know, the, the two of them wander off. They've left the other, you know, troopers to drink whiskey. These two wander off to, you know, to continue drinking. She strips off naked and she starts cleaning herself. And, and Joseph just looks up to her and he's like, God damn, you're beautiful. Well, no, it's, I don't know if it's creepy. I was like, she's just stripped off topless it, in front of a man. It, it, it's only, I mean, it's it's not, it's not. Well, I mean, it, it is slightly off, but it, it's off in the sense that that moment is what the the writing and the filmmakers have decided is the catalyst for these two to have a love interest. I and will, it feels no, no, no. so forced. The whole arc does feel weirdly fast forward. Yeah. And this is the problem with so many things going on in this film. You're completely right. Um, let's be honest, you might have a fairly stunted understanding of love. But let's roll with that. He shouldn't. He's he's divorcee. Um, maybe he has a family back on Earth. Who knows? Um, beyond just an ex-wife. And they, they, that's spoke about in the bar way back at the start of the film. And, they, and there's just so much going on. They're covering so many bases. Like I said, they introduced that whole base at the very beginning that was then just discarded. Yeah. Which we're not really going to go back to the main base properly Again, in yeah. this film. And this is the pro another problem with the film. Is it's so much going on. Again, many chefs were involved in baking this pie. The writing to it might have been the, the reason it got so stock bogged down in these... <sighs> complicated subplots and there's so much going on because you don't know um but i like all these like mysteries that are being I do set like up them. and they don't all need to be resolved or answered they don't, well it kind of not it, enough of them are answered that's probably the issue because well you don't even get a foreshadowing of answers i mean it, it, it's it's uh, i mean earth made these evil screamers so they might have. The scientists must have had some understanding about building in contingencies. They're not told. They're never told the commander. That. Well, no, it's because the war is still going on. So any kind of contingencies to stop them right now would be irrelevant. Well, the, commander, the robots are doing what they were yeah, programmed the to commander, do. The Kill the enemy. The commander knows things at the end. Um. And like that, well, the very end where you know there's certain things the commander needs to know, and he, but knowing how to shut them down if they went rogue. I mean, surely they had the idea that could happen. Clearly, they've gone rogue, if you haven't guessed by now. They, they, they wear these little wrist things to make their heartbeats irregular that trick the ones that burrow. Doesn't work on the little, the, the now sentient ones. Um, and these kids are obviously screaming at them and charging at them and, you know, they, they have to destroy them. And they're... Um, the only thing we didn't mention at this point is he gets me, he's messaging back to his base. And like, we got a guest! And it cuts out. She's like, can't hear you, Bob. I'll ring you back tomorrow. And it's like, oh, oh. <laughs> Hello. Chuck. Hi, right, okay, we got a new arrival. We made yesterday. Nothing to worry about. Come in, Cicero. Chuck, you're breaking up. Chuck, copy? Maybe I can hear you real well. It's a kid, Chuck. It's a little boy. Don't let it into the bunker if you copy. I can't. <laughs> so his entire base is very much, again, it's not subtle. That's the other issue you get with this. There's no subtlety to it. Like the kid, a bit suspicious. Kid's a robot. Cool, that explains it. Okay. And sh oh, our, our boss, boss, we've got a visitor. Is it a small kid? Um, that's the question I would have immediately asked. Cool, shoot it. Um, <laughs> it's a robot. It's trying to kill you. Don't let any of those into the base. Um, you'll all live. Um, instead, no. No, no, no. We all well, know. We already know from that little snippet of conversation. They're screwed. I know, but that—that's what I liked. Like we didn't need to see it. Just hearing that—that that broken no, 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 communication. That was, good. that was good. Yeah. But you, it's the other bit where you meet the kid and you're like, "That's so on the nose," and you're like, "Oh," and it's just so quickly resolved. That's the problem. 
the bits which I want to know the answers about are never properly answered. It's all left ambiguous. But the bits like that, oh, oh I know exactly what's going on. Rom- the romance. Oh, it just happened. Oh. It was just the filmmakers using a shortcut to establish it and so that they could build upon it. But for me, the two of them didn't really have that much chemistry. So it just didn't really work. It wasn't yeah. very effective. And the kid, the kid, you don't, it's too out of the blue. It's too weird. It's, you don't have the kid acting as a kid. Like, oh, because it's an earlier version. Because he keeps pulling microchips out of robots through the whole of the film. So they're like, oh, version one, sh- version two, version three. Oh, it's got hieroglyphs on. I don't know what's going on anymore. <laughs> and it's just like, cool, that's not helping us anymore. Having more vagaries. It's like, it's a triangle instead of a circle with hieroglyphs on. And you're like, oh, bollocks. Um, and and, and that, again, it's the ambiguity where you're like, the kid sh- should have been more of a sleeper. I like the bit that they use in later when more of them show up, but it is the lack of, I don't know, the lack of subtlety in that one moment where they're being overly subtle with so many other things. They're not being subtle with that. I had absolutely zero issue with the ambiguity. I loved all of the mysteries and all of the things I think you're digging for didn't need to be answered in this. I think they did. I I just don't, I don't think... Well, we'll keep going. We'll keep going. Well, the moment we're, we're <laughs> heading towards... We're going to head to the next military base where the NEB commanders were, were stationed. And he's looking for the NEB commander. To continue to make peace, because that is what he's here for. Yeah, he wants peace. <laughs> and again, this is another one of my favourite favorite shots. I think they used like a famous uh, stadium somewhere uh, and then filled it to make it look like, you know, this the stronghold, this command uh, HQ. But there's no bodies. There's just blood everywhere i know and it's strange it's a film that dances with horror and gore well there's one corpse one emaciated a true true corpse, true and that's not super terrible but joseph theorizes that perhaps the bodies have been taken away because when the bodies decompose they let off methane gas perhaps you know the screamers are using this gas or using these organic parts or whatever to, make the kids. to, to fuel them or to you know to make more flesh for other screamers it's like it's interesting we don't know for fact but it's it's set up to credit the film, it's playing a non-conventional horror game because they're not really trying to stop the screamers, which is a little bit well, confusing. Well, it, it at the moment sets they... up the fact that you know screamers now have the ability to to replicate and look and appear human-ish, and you know they they talk about one of the Mark II versions of screamers that pretended to be soldiers that had been injured and would lay there asking for help. And uh, and they mention that they've in, you know that they've met these screamers before or the NEBs have and of course Joseph you know the Alliance commander is just like I've never experienced or seen any of these other types of screamers just the burrowers just the claw ones in in the ground um, and you know when he activates the computer terminal and he gets the rest of this information about what's going on he's just like well well shit <laughs> yeah and it's foreshadowing because he's looking for different versions and trying to get his head around all the different yeah. models to see what they look like and obviously we know that he's but well well we also find out at this point that the screamers now don't care about the alliance wristbands and one of them proceeds to try and attack both ace and ross um and so they have to have to gun it down uh they also then it also explains about the army of davids that that were around and that they are now outside this base, and then we also get like more, more you, you um, say paranoia ripped off. With yeah, <laughs> we get more paranoia about who might actually now be a screamer and who's pretending to be human. And we get the sequence where where uh, Becker keeps winding Ross up, and he's just like, you know, the thing about the Mark Twos is they end up repeating the same line over and over again. It's almost like their microchips can't formulate. A, another response and ross keeps saying get off my back get off my back get off my back and so becker ends up throwing his knife at him and killing ross you know and joseph retrieves the blade and he's like well i think you just killed a human granted he was he was you know terrified of everything he was acting out he was acting strangely but at least he wasn't murderous no yeah and again i don't know it just um the amount of robots in play at this point is quite ridiculous. Well, once all the Davids turn up at the facility, you know, they decide they, they need to leg it. They need to get out of there. And so it's kind of, it's like an action chase sequence, but we don't actually see any of the Davids pursuing them. No, and also... We, we can hear them. There's no vehicles on this planet either. Which no. They're spaceships that fly, but they didn't send them a June buggy. No. I mean... So they basically <laughs> have to hoof it all the way back. And they do. They literally run all the way back now all the way back to the original Alliance base. 
And when they get there, they're just like, open, open the door, let us in. And we hear, we hear his friend inside like, no, you open the door and come on down. And he's like, no, come on up and open the door. No, come on in. And you already know it's screwed. We, we, we heard we the heard radio the transmission kid, yeah. earlier. And so because they, neither of them are, are giving any way, the doors eventually open and we are introduced to the army of Davids, which... I have to say, like, at the time, it was fine. Looking at it now, I'm like, this. it's it's pretty awful seeing all of these half-assed masks on all these, these David models that are pouring out of the building. We get this, <laughs> this awkward kind of last stand kind of firefight where the four of them get up onto this, this, got some this elevated the position. Um, and, you know, they've got flamethrowers. It's like it's the middle of the night. So when these jets of flame go off, we can see that none of the actors from the film are there. It's all stunt doubles. Um, it's, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's, some, some of the, the lighting here seems off. Um, you know, it, it, yeah. it, it's the big action moment of the film, but it's not that exciting because these Davids are just very slowly walking towards them. Yeah, it is a weird choice. And as I said, there's a lot of weird choice in this film. And I think the bits I'm grumbling about, and again, I keep going back to, I will point out, I don't think anybody knows what the hell they were doing. Because apparently, like we said, there might be four writers involved in this. And everyone's changing the game every few minutes. So we're like, oh no, I'll do this instead. I was like, well, what's the justification? It doesn't really matter. Nobody knows what's going on anyway. It's just like, brilliant. And that's that's my feeling behind this film. It's got a, a thousand ideas. They threw them at a wall. Some stuck. And they went with it. I had no problem with the ideas. I have a problem with the execution of this big action sequence that just no, doesn't... No, no, but the robot's... <laughs> Kids just aren't a threat. Exactly. The yes. screamers that burrow through the ground are far more worrisome. I like where they shoot. They still have to fight those while fighting the kids. And eventually, like we're getting overrun by the very slow-moving children. Nuka right. Rico. Well, he does. Uh. He ends up. He ends up going. Hey, I know you stole that nuke from the NEB base. Give it to me. And he launches it at some tanks, which then explode. And in that explosion shot, I'm like, there are no screamer kids in that shot. I'm like, where did they all go? And then they wake up all knackered. And well, they wake up and all of a sudden you know, that blast the turned it into, and... into daytime. Yeah, well, they all slept till day. I don't know. Like, after the explosion, they seem they all got knocked over. It was weird. So... No, no, they did. They all got knocked over. All the day... They wake up in daytime. So you're like, well, I guess they were knocked out by the nuke, which is obviously what nukes do. And they blew up all the Davids, who didn't really... They just all laid down and over there. Um, oh, we don't know. We, didn't... we never see the piles of bodies no, of no, David no, bodies. No, no, you see a little field of them. Kind of they're like outside the main gates. They're all laid down. They're okay. just laid down. Right. It isn't particularly gruesome, or it, no. it doesn't jump out at you. <laughs> Again, this is. <sighs> well, now it's time for the, the next big reveal. As uh, Becca ends up grabbing Ace and squeezes him at the hips, and then throws him into the side, killing him. Down. Down to hell and see that I sent you there. No. Because he was playing an injured soldier. Which was the pun that they set up. Yeah. He was like, oh, I've been injured by the nuke. It's like, come and help me. It's like, I'll help you. And then he does a, he, a weird kill. Again, it's just another weird thing. I can only imagine pilot. that maybe the blast has caused him to partially malfunction to give up his cover as a, as a screamer well, at this point. The, I, this is the bit where you scratch your head because what's their motive? None of this has motive. That's my other issue. And again, no, no, it, I keep picking, but it's just like... The screamers were designed to kill humans. They're not doing very well. They could have done it days ago. They had to sleep at some point. Stab, stab. He'd already knifed one in the chest. None of the motive makes sense. That's... The problem, and again, it keeps piling on. Like it's just like, are they playing with their food? Doesn't make sense. Are they trying to go off the planet? That doesn't make sense. None of the ending makes any sense. And here, or here on out, isn't great. This is where the film, I think, we both agree, slips because there's still well, cool bits. It certainly does in terms of its visual uh, quality in it, in the effects department. As uh, Becker and Joseph have a bit of a fight, he shoots Becker in the face. And we see, you know, the part of the metallic, yeah. you know, under surface. But then he blasts him in the midsection and he explodes and falls into two parts. And it is just probably, probably the second worst effect in the film. I don't know how they thought they would get away with putting that in there. Just like, just cut it. Just cut to the two parts laying in the ground because... Or just blast him and then cut to the point where you want the a live model falling in two. Yeah, so, it's badly uh, superimposed. It, it's very cheap looking. It's uh, unfortunate. Yeah, it feels like they ran out of money near the end of this film or something went wrong. And also, 
as I said, there is a deterioration over the remaining rush job finale that we're entering into now. Well, now it's another, you know, a montage moment. Well, he cuts it first because he pulls it... out the chip of the new one and goes, it's hieroglyphic. The pyramid, as I said before, it's a triangle. He doesn't. Have, there's no number right anymore because I guess they figured out he was looking at it, I guess. Because they're hiding it from the one guy who doesn't really know anything about electronics, but just keeps checking these these memory chip, you know, the microchip that runs them. And then he cuts her hand when he hands it to her to check she's human. She bleeds. So he's like, thank God, at least you're human. But yeah, the love story doesn't really lead anywhere because it doesn't really have time. There's no lovemaking scene. Well, the, I mean, they have a long, you know, extended kiss sequence, but then we don't, we get a sense that they've been traveling for quite some time in order to get to this remote location, which has a space shuttle that is there for an it's evacuation for the commander. Again, and there's a beautiful so ruined bridge. We, we see how exhausted she appears when they slowly eventually make their way there. You mm. know, they've run out of anti-radiation cigarettes, you know, and so it's, uh, we do get a sense that they've been, you know, together for some time when they get there, you know, and again, it's an interesting looking facility. They did their best to, you know, to make something that looked like a launch pad I for like the shuttle. The facility. I mean, again, it's the, the budgets they're playing to were pretty big, relatively speaking, for this. But I, I don't know quite what happened. Yeah. Because it, uh, they, they did invest a lot in, I guess, modern technology for that time, maybe. And that's maybe where we're grumbling at the CGI, but it was actually horrifyingly expensive to look naff all True. these years later. True. <laughs> I mean, we, have, we are looking at a film that's over 25 years old. And that's kind of a quarter of a century, which is kind yeah. of crazy if you think about it. We were kids when this was made. Um... So the final setup for the film then is to you know prep the you know the shuttle to uh, to to leave the planet. But there's a crane that's kind of blocking its trajectory. So he ends up sent sending. Uh, sending Jessica down to the shuttle while he goes off to go and fix the crane. And that's when he gets surprise jumped uh, by his old friend, oh. who is a screamer who's now wearing the face of his old partner from, from the though. Alliance. Didn't he have tears on his face? The, the broader point I'm going to make here immediately is none of that made any sense. And on top of which, the, how did they get in? It was a, like a rock face with a secret door they had to go yeah. in. Maybe... <laughs> I guess it could have been her, but I mean, uh, none of it makes any sense, and that's the problem I keep having. having well, he, he he knew where the where the shuttle was. It was designed for the commanding officer. Only he knew where it and was, and he and he had to do a scan with the palm of his hand in order for the door to open. Yeah, and obviously you'd assume it's shut behind him. Maybe. Uh, yeah. And that, were they already in there? Did they know where he was going? Did they? Again, at this point, I'd imagine so. I guess, but again, it's just like, oh, they got in. There was a vent. So I took his face. He didn't have much use for it anyway. But you know what? I like your face better. I mean, the whole finale just came a bit... They didn't need that final fight. Uh, it was already... I mean, I think... They needed something. They did something, but I did... I mean, like, he's... Yeah, we... There's only one seat in the shuttle, so he's going to let her take it. Yes. Um, but then he's fighting the evil robot. And then... Well, he, he kills that robot, so the, the, the big fight's over, he makes his way down there, and that's when they discover there's only one seat in the shuttle. Yeah. And so he's like, screw it, you're going. And she's like, no, I don't want to go, you go. And then we get the revelation when another Jessica uh, screamer turns up and then starts fighting uh, the both of them. And she's doing high kicks and punches and, you know... and. Hendrickson literally just gets thrown across the room, knocked out, and then it's basically just these two uh, screamers fighting each other. And it is, for me, one of the most interesting parts when we now have the rebel the realization that you know Jessica was a screamer this whole time, but like the other screamer just said, you know they've they're, they're learning, they're they're getting feelings, they can smile, they can bleed. So it's like we're seeing like a rapid evolution of these screamers, which is fairly interesting. Yeah, yeah. Which and is, so good yeah. Jessica ends up destroying bad Jessica, but she's also, you know, mortally wounded at the same time. Um, and, you know, and we get like the final like goodbye as Hendrickson you know, watches, watches her die. And you're like, so, you know, this Jessica actually, you know, she didn't want to get in the shuttle. She didn't want to go to Earth. She didn't want to go and assimilate or kill everybody. She kind of learned. 
humanity by spending this time with him. But you don't see any of that. You... There's no arc justifying it, and that's the problem. The payoff doesn't work because you have no setup. The payoff doesn't oh. work because the two of them have no real chemistry, but I still thought it was a fascinating idea and an insight into what's happening with the Screamers. Yeah, I mean, again, like I said, this is a film of half ideas. It's it's not badly executed. It's I hate. I think it is badly I mean, it executed. Is badly, yeah, no, no. But I think the, the idea is a solid and fantastic. Yeah, the acting isn't bad anywhere throughout this. And uh, as we now follow the commander, he shoots off into space, and that's the in, end a, of the in, film. A, in a horrific CGI shuttle again, dodgy CGI. But again, it's against one of the backgrounds, and it's all for what for its time. I guess it was okay, but. Again, and he's like, shoots off to space, and then there's the classic horror trope of a little teddy bear, sitting, one of the children's teddy bears being in, the, in there with him. And I'm like, did he bring that with him? He did bring it with yeah. him. He has it with him throughout the, you know, from the from the moment they, he, they kill David, he has that teddy bear with him the rest yeah, of the like, film. Yeah, you're like, that's smart. <laughs> well, I guess he wasn't expecting, uh, you know, to be bringing a screamer on board with him. Yeah, because the teddies were a backup stream, screamer in case he killed the kid. Again... Whoever or whatever's designing these is having a bit of a wacky adventure. Um, All I'll say is at least this film's ending isn't as dire as, say, the original story. No, <laughs> the original's pretty great. That's game over in that book. Yeah, I mean, but yeah, in this one, you'd assume if they, you know, went anywhere with it, it would have. Well, sadly, the uh, in oh. 2000 and I think nine, they did oh. release a sequel called Screamers Hunting. Oh, The Hunting. And that film basically has no original ideas. It basically recreates the the, the the first Screamers movie with less money and I had I hate to say it less talent. No Peter. But Weller. they also definitively give an answer as to what happened to Joseph Hendrickson at the end of this film that he blew up the ship and they disintegrated on re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. So you know Hendrickson made sure that no Screamer managed to make it to Earth. But it's just like, well, thanks for giving us the, the teddy canonical bears were ending. really easy to kill. You could have just been like, hi guys, I'm going to land, wherever this rocket comes down, look for a teddy bear. It's a dangerous threat to the whole planet. Um, he wasn't taking any chances. Yeah, he could but... like, you know, instead he just killed himself. I mean, he couldn't have dealt with a teddy bear. <laughs> avoid, avoid, avoid Screamers the Hunting. Yeah, the hunting's terrible. This, on the other well, hand, just... has glimmers. I mean, like we well, said... What were your favourite scenes from the film? Uh, he has a few good scenes. But again... Um, it's all the glue that sticks it together that doesn't work. I, I think I like the post-apocalyptic wandering the most. Um, the painted background, sure, but they've done it with scenery in the foreground and it just, just, just works really nicely as you kind of get those kind of... It feels realistic enough. The planet's kind of... Was apparently a, a paradise. It's mentioned again in various sequences. They destroyed paradise, and it was the mining that destroyed it because it created the radiation, which was creating all the problems. And then they had a war. Then they made further problems by nuking and you know bombing and blowing everything to smithereens. Um, and it, again, it's beautifully tragic and it's haunting. And again, this film's probably trying to be too many things at once, which is the po beautiful post-apocalyptia while also having this kind of complex war which is sort of going on on a planet that's blown to smithereens that's no real value left to it. So the, the rationale behind all of this is vague and like, oh no, Earth's keeping you here because your family's back home, but your family's back home don't... You're all dying at such a rate of all these stupid instances. There's nobody's left here. If Earth wants to lie about you being here and still fighting the war, they can. They don't need to give you food supplies and, and have anything go on. So none of... Again... Sorry, I'm going so off. So, just any favourite uh, scenes from the film, Jess? <laughs> it's just annoyed me so much. I'm having a hard time thinking clearly. <laughs> Sorry, this is, it's more annoyed me as we've talked about it than it, it did initially. Um, yes, the opening scene with the execution of the guy just outside the base was very good. I mean, the the, the screamer there, they invested the money and the, uh, the time to get it looking good. Problem is, the rest of the film doesn't use those screamers, which I argue are the standout cool little burrowing villain. Especially the animatronic, or the stop motion one that appears in the facility and plugs itself into the computer and then he, terminal. That, that's where he realises the message was probably fake that was sent to yes, him. Yes, yeah. Um, even though it was delivered by hand, doesn't mean it wasn't, that wasn't another fake screamer or a man tricked by fake screamers to deliver the message to the base. So again, the duplicity just becomes abstract because what's the motive for the screamers here? Are they just dicking with people for fun? 
Maybe. But again, that's not explained. They're learning. They're learning. <laughs> learning what? Uh, anyway, but the, the the confusion duplicity of it aside, um, I felt that those screamers should have been the monster of the movie. And this is where my biggest criticism again keeps coming back. There's too much going on. They're spinning too many plates. And they don't keep them all spinning. A lot are just hitting the floor. Um, they should have gone with one enemy um, thematically. If you're going to do body... Uh, body snatching sort of movie or you've got these enemy amongst us theme that's fine do that but the screamers were already set up they were cool burrowing monsters the moment they stopped tracking working with the heart monitors would have been terrifying as a movie thematically anyway um but then you've got oh kids sneaky kids that are coming in they all look identical though so okay that's not going to hold up as an overall premise and but you're having all these different body snatching that could have just been a theme um they should have been i think they should have blown up like the factory stop the burrowing ones and then you would have just focused on the shapeshifters as it were but instead it was everything um and that's why i'm getting so distracted by it um but so any other favorite scenes from yeah. the film Jess? ah sorry um other favorite scenes sure um when they go to the enemy base, I thought, as you said, the stadium sequence was really cool. Again, this is low on gore terms. This film doesn't get carried away with the gore. One body in that whole base, I guess they're recycling them, as we said. But that's not explored. The horror of that would have been interesting to explore. Other films with a much lower budget explore recycling human bodies. Um, so when they're walking around this base and get to this kind of cool panel system where he's hacking in and... Then they're all running back and leave the commander because the commander gets, he's desperately trying to find out information on what's going on, which is good because the curiosity of our central lead is is paramount. But I do feel they could have delivered a little bit more in, I, I, idea of what's exactly going on at that point. Uh, actually, whoever throws the knife's really cool, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because he'd been sharpening that knife religiously for a lot of it and threw it, and just like that was robotically executed. Oh no, um, he was a robot. Uh, so yeah, again. <sighs> What was your favourite scenes, Gary? Because I could go on about what confused oh, me. Uh, yes, I think you could. <laughs> it's fine. Um, I'm going to say, yeah, the uh, the opening sequence with, with the first soldier coming over the horizon and being absolutely butchered by screamers, watching him lose his limbs, watching the reactions of the Alliance troopers in the bunker. It really sells you on the uh, severity and the horror of what these screamers are capable yeah. of. And as an opening to the film, seeing what happened to him by these screamers, that that lingers over the rest of the film. So you know what the screamers are capable of. So you know when you see them or see them burrowing, they are a threat. They are a threat to everybody yes. because they can instantly kill you. I also think the introduction to the our first David was very creepy. Just the way his voice sounds human, but it's just slightly... The pitch is just slightly off, so it sounds strange and then of course the realization when david is actually shot i thought yeah. it was a it was a real cool surprise in the film um i also really liked the uh the rock insect creature i thought that was pretty yeah, cool that was fine. um i also really liked the aftermath of the screamers attack in the facility just all the blood everywhere and nearly all the bodies gone i was just like that's a really cool setup and I, I really liked the, the, the twist ending. Like, I didn't believe Jessica was, was a screamer, you know, after he did the blood test yeah, and oh, then yeah. the, the realisation that there was a second one, which is like, oh, wow. Like, you know, it, may, it makes you see the film in a whole new light, somewhat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, again, but at a certain point you then realise almost half the cast, in you know, 40% of the cast at one point were, were, were screamers, yeah. Which just leaves you going, ah, oh. and, and, and it became too random. That that was probably my issue because you were like, oh, it's him. No, it's him. And then it, 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 and I'm like, okay, the, the the thing does this better. <laughs> well, of course it does. Of course but, it does. But but the film that's going to play body snatchers, or not even body snatchers. I mean, maybe it is. I don't know. Invasion of the Body Snatchers sort of theme does work here. It's it's the idea that you, everyone's becoming evil robots and you don't know and they're wearing the faces of friends. That's a whole premise in itself. And this film, if it had been better written and gelled together by direction and the problem is that i think there were too many as we said too many people rewriting scripts that a lot of this might have just been made up on the fly and it's been moved from the original planet and the original book and the original adaptation and it's maybe not as dark but it's still dark it's weird so are you going to recommend this because this is the thing i'm going to to you jess i'll start as always but um my, my feeling is yes it is a fun film and it is definitely intriguing but 
there's a lot of caveats because it is a film that I feel aims for so many targets and too many. And that's the thing. It's trying to go and cover so much sci-fi ground that it's not nailing any single piece very well. And that's the biggest criticism. It's not a great body snatchers film. It's interesting. It's not a great horror film because it's not using the classic horror elements like the borrowing monsters. The go- it's not a great gore fest film, so it's not a proper B movie horror in that sense. Um, it's not got a very good romance story in it. Um, as I said, the narrative as the overall grand game of mastermind going on like if there was a mastermind computer or something playing pulling the strings here at least vaguely foreshadowed it would make more sense but nobody's pulling the strings it's either complete coincidence all of this happens the message is sent by the other side or it's sent by the screamers for whatever silly reason because they want the commander to go for a walk so they can trick his base though the commander would have fallen for the child as well so there was never a reason to lure anyone out because you'd already killed everyone there was one human living with two screamers in a bunker which again that doesn't make any sense because why didn't they just kill him he was just a, uh, again it's it's all these loose plot threads that just don't really lead anywhere that they don't have any payoff. That's the issue. Payoff. It's not a matter of whether or not it's interesting. You have to pay off these plot threads. If you've got a thousand plot threads that don't pay off, a good story can be mysterious. But normally, if you want to be mysterious with a mysterious, you go, here's the answer. But now the, the answer's sort of got some other questions attached to it, leaving you further kind of um, strings to pull out if you want to do sequels or spin offs or something. So, yes, watch it. If you like actiony, horror-y, mystery sort of films. And it is an interesting artifact of its time. But I honestly don't think it's that great. So watch it. Enjoy it. The final third gets a bit confused. The opening couple of thirds may are okay because the visuals and the action don't go beyond their means. <laughs> what do you think of it though, Gary? Because... My answer's like, yeah, it's all right. (laughs) Well, I absolutely am going to be recommending Screamers. This is an often very overlooked and forgotten gem. It's definitely a B-movie, and some of the effects look as bad now as they did in (laughs) 95. But those bad effects don't detract from an otherwise highly entertaining story that was incredibly ambitious. Not all the effects are bad. The matte paintings in particular are fantastic and really help with the scope and the world building and the atmosphere really highlighting the desolation the destruction and the barren loneliness of the planet the stop motion robotic effects are charming but the compositing in cgi can really hurt your eyes peter weller really holds the whole film together as he commands your attention and gives the story a lot of believability while the rest of the cast all do a really good job The cinematography was decent, and the music, while not memorable, was serviceable to the film. It was well-paced and nicely edited, and considering its low budget, I couldn't help but be impressed. It may not be action-packed or overly gory, and the love story may feel forced and lacking chemistry, but it makes up for it with great sets, good story, strong sense of paranoia and mystery. It doesn't hit all its marks. But it's well worth watching, and it's still good on several rewatches. And if you're a fan of this genre, then it's an absolute must watch. Thanks for watching Off the Shelf Reviews. Bye bye.